This evening we're going to read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. As you know, we're doing a series called They Met the Master. And this evening we come to Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. This is on page 1061. 1061. For 2,000 years nearly, nobody understood verse 13 really, except the information that was given there. Today, you can go and visit Emmaus, the actual site which has been discovered in the lifetime of most people in this hall this evening. We're talking history. We're talking real people and real places. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things? And then enter his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way. And how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. You'll notice that he broke two sorts of bread in that passage. Did you? There was the scriptures and he just broke it open for them to see what it was all about. Those Old Testament books suddenly made sense. And then he broke the bread, the physical bread. 
acting as the host in the house to which he was invited as a guest. Well, we're talking about they met the master. This is number 10. And today we come to Cleopas and his friend, possibly Cleopas and his wife, but certainly Cleopas and his friend. We know very little about Cleopas, but first of all, we need to remember that this is the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And Luke emphasizes that in that passage in Luke 24. And we have these two people. Uh, there's another Clopas mentioned in the Bible, but Clopas is an Aramaic or Hebrew word, and Cleopas is a Greek word, and probably they're not the same person. And what do we know about Cleopas? Very little. We've read everything that's known about him in the passage. Did you notice in Luke 24, verse 13? Now that day, two of them were going to a village. Two of who? Two of whom? Well, there was the 12, as you know, there were the 12 disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were the 70 in addition to them. And there were about 500 others who owned up publicly to being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and maybe many more. So the Cleopas and his friends certainly weren't members of the 12. Maybe they were members of the 70. Or maybe they were members of the 500 or the others. And one thing is for certain is that they were both disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I say it's possible that it was Cleopas and his wife? Uh, simply because of what I've read in the commentaries, which say this, that when the Lord looks like he's going to go further, uh, these two say, stay with us, and that would never have occurred to anyone to say that except a woman. <laughs> That's what the commentaries say. So maybe it was... Cleopas and his wife. Now that, that's speculation. We don't know who they were. All we know is that the Lord has been crucified. There's rumors that he's alive, but they, don't, they haven't seen him. They know the grave is empty. The women have seen that. And there's been so much hubbub, so much tension, so much pressure, and so much danger in Jerusalem that these two seem to have decided, well, let's get out. And they get out and start walking into the countryside to Emmaus, where maybe they lived or had someone with whom they could stay, or maybe they were city dwellers who had a holiday house. I don't know. Seven and a half miles. But the purpose of their walk is to get away and to talk together and try and work through in their mind everything that's happened over the past few days with the arrest and the the six ungodly trials of Jesus and the crucifixion and the burial and now the stories of the resurrection which are coming through and the mystery of the empty grave. And as they're walking along, a stranger catches up with them. Nothing unusual with that. We're so used to now driving around in cars that perhaps if we were walking in the country and someone came alongside us and just joined in the conversation we might think it was a bit odd. Maybe we would think even we were going to get mugged. But that's not the way it was in the culture in those days. It was perfectly normal if someone was walking on their own for them to catch up with somebody else or for you to catch up with them, just talk away for the period of the journey. Yeah. It's an aspect of our culture we haven't got anymore because we go around in these boxes, these metal boxes on wheels, and we've forgotten that sort of socializing. And they're talking together. And he can see from the way that they look that they're talking about something which is making them extremely disappointed and sad. Now, what, what are you talking about, he says. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's been going on in Jerusalem these last few days? What things are, what things are those? And then they explain about the Lord Jesus Christ and they explain about how he was mighty as a prophet before God and before men. They explain about what he taught and what he did and how he's been arrested and crucified. And then it all comes to a head 
Can you see it there? It's in verse 21. We had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. So you've got two people walking together, sharing a disappointed hope. The cause of most sadness in the world is a disappointed hope. And that's what's happening to them. We thought he would eventually rescue the, the Jews from the, from the Romans. Uh, we thought that he, he was the one who was going to be at last the, the Messiah that we've been waiting for, who will s- set us all free from the oppression of invading nations. We had hoped, but it's all come to nothing. He's died. That's, that's why we're, we're downcast. Uh, that's what we've been talking about and then the Lord starts talking to them I love Luke 24 it's one of my favorite passages and I'm allowed to preach on it isn't it wonderful verse 25 how foolish you are and then he begins to explain that this is the way it had to be for God's promised Christ and takes them through the scriptures and proves that what has happened could only have happened to the Messiah. It was all predicted and they are transformed. What a day it was for them. They start the day in despair and they end the day by running seven and a half miles back to Jerusalem, having already walked seven and a half miles. Amazing day. They start in unbelief and bewilderment And they end the day with joy and assurance. Never had a day like that. They start the day with hearts which are all mixed up and numb. But they end the day with hearts which are burning. And that's why the passage is so valuable. It talks to us about feltness. The feltness of true religion. True Christianity is believed, true Christianity is practiced, and true Christianity is felt. And if you believe and practice, but don't feel what you believe and practice, it's very unlikely indeed that you have yet had a meeting with Jesus Christ himself. What we have in this passage, and I have seven brief points, is we have two disciples having an experience. They are having an experience. There it is in verse 32. They ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us? while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. And it's one of those glorious passages which show to us that there is such a thing as spiritual experience. There's something to feel. And if you don't feel the something, there is something ingloriously wrong. Two disciples are having an experience. That's the first point. Number two. Two disciples here are having an identical experience. Here they are talking to each other. They both say the same thing. They asked each other, verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Did you feel like that? Yes. Did you feel like that? Yes, and they're both having this experience of the burning heart. Now, Christian friends and other people who are present, spiritual experience isn't always like that. We need to understand straight away before we go any further that there is such a thing as diversity in spiritual experience and also unity in spiritual experience. I'll give a couple of examples. For example, the Old Testament. Israel's taken out of... It's country and 
exile to Babylon and then a large group of people come back and they're there some years but eventually they get around to rebuilding the temple they lay the foundations and it's wonderful isn't it the foundations of the temple have been laid again and some people play musical instruments and some people sing and everybody else almost shouts but I said almost because some people when they see just those little foundations and what a small place it's going to be they weep and scripture says you can't the, the weeping was loud and the shouting was loud there was a terrific din this is a rough translation of the Hebrew and you couldn't tell the shouting from the weeping isn't that interesting there's the same event some people shout some people play musical instruments some people sing and some people weep it's the same event so there's there's diversity in spiritual experience and you, you actually see the same in the Gospels after our Lord has risen from the dead and after this event in fact several weeks after this event when he comes to ascend just before he ascends we read that some of his disciples worshipped him but some others who were there in his presence doubted some said look felt oh this is too wonderful to believe oh Lord and some people thought this is incredible I'm not actually sure that I'm believing what's happening to me and there you have diversity of spiritual experience but not in this passage and nor later in the passage look at verse 37 because while they, when they've got back to Jerusalem these two and have joined everybody else there we read verse 36 while they were still talking about this Jesus himself stood among them and said to them peace be with you they were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost all of them were so they're having an identical experience verse 41 while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement they were all filled with joy and amazement or verse 52 the moment of the ascension then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they stayed continually at the temple praising God so although I'm going to talk about spiritual experience this evening from this passage you must understand that there is nonetheless a diversity in spiritual experience even though in most cases like in this passage there's often a wonderful unity you know when the gospels preached people have different reactions some people when the gospel is preached and they see the wonder that Jesus Christ the eternal son of God died for them they weep other people go completely silent and show nothing and some people especially the braver types they shout hallelujah I've been in meetings where some have wept and some have danced same meeting same place same truth difference of experience so two disciples are having an experience two disciples are both having an identical experience now the third point let's think about the author of this experience verse 15 Luke 24 verse 15 as they talked and discussed these things with each other Jesus himself came up and walked along with them at this stage they're kept from recognizing him because as you know after the resurrection although our Lord had a true body it was a body capable of moving in the spiritual dimension and you couldn't actually recognize him without spiritual insight and it hasn't been given to them at, at this moment but why is spiritual experience possible how come that there is such a thing the answer to that is that Jesus Christ is really risen from the dead he still meets people he, if Jesus Christ was in the tomb 
every spiritual experience would be a fake. It would be some form of counterfeit from the devil or some form of emotional manipulation. But because there is a risen Lord Jesus Christ who actually does meet with people even today, spiritual experience is a reality. And the author of all spiritual experience, all true spiritual experience, is Jesus Christ himself. It's not Calvinistic Methodism. It's not the music. It's nothing else like that. If it's true spiritual experience, it's brought about by Christ in the soul of the person. So, two disciples having an experience, an identical experience, and the author of it is Christ. Point number four. The means of this experience is Scripture. God can act directly, often does act directly, but usually works through Scripture. So, what do they say in verse 32? They said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And it's the imperfect tense in the original language, which means from the moment he started talking till the moment that he was disappeared out of their sight, throughout that whole time, their hearts were warmed up inside while he talked to them from the scriptures. What did he do with those scriptures? Verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, notice all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning what? Himself. He talked about himself. Now, if you will forgive me, I'm going to do what no preacher should ever do, and that's give you a long quotation. When I'm trying to help young men to preach a bit better, I say, whatever you do, never have a long quotation. <laughs> never ever. Well, here's the hypocrite speaking. <laughs> this is from Campbell Morgan on this particular passage. And it's an extract from one of his sermons. Are you ready? If, if you fall asleep, I'll... I'll bang, okay? Here's Campbell Morgan. Here I propose to indulge myself for a moment and say, I never read this story without feeling that I would have given anything to have walked down that road and heard him open the scriptures. He began with Moses and then went through all the prophets. I dare not trust myself to attempt to dwell on that at any length, but we may reverently survey the field. He began with Moses. And the reference was to the books which we call the Pentateuch. Their own scriptures, the first five books, the Torah, the law. He showed them how all types, all ritual, all ceremonial were fulfilled in him. He passed from that to the prophets. And if we take the reference as applying to those prophetic writings which we find in the Bible, there are certain things which are perfectly plain from the stately language of Isaiah, through all the minor and major of the music of the prophets, to the teaching of the seers and psalmists, all was moving towards himself. He is David's king, fairer than all the children of men. And in the days of Solomon's well-doing, he it was that was altogether lovely, chiefest among ten thousand. He was Isaiah's child king, with a shoulder strong to bear the government, and the name Emmanuel gathering within itself all excellencies. He was Jeremiah's branch of righteousness, executing judgment and righteousness in the land. He was Ezekiel's plant of renown, giving shade and shedding fragrance. He was Daniel's stone, cut without hands, smiting the image and becoming a mountain and filling the whole earth. He was the ideal Israel of Hosea, growing as a lily, casting out his roots as Lebanon. In Joel, he was the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. 
He was usher in of the fulfillment of the vision of Amos. He, of the plowman overtaking the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. He brought about Obadiah's vision of deliverance upon Mount Zion and holiness. He was the fulfillment of that which, of which Jonah was a sign. Turning again of God, of which Micah spoke. The one who Nahum saw upon the mountains, publishing peace. The anointing, the anointed, of whom Habakkuk sang, as going forth for salvation. He it was who brought to the people the pure language of Zephaniah's message. He was the true Zerubbabel of Haggai's word, rebuilding the city and the house of God. He was the dawn of the day, when holiness unto the Lord shall be upon the bells of the horses, as Zechariah had foretold. And he, the refiner, the fullest soap, the son of righteousness, of whom Ma Ma Malachi had spoken. Whew. You following this? On that Emmaus road, these two unknown disciples heard him at least show them that these things were so. He thus brought them back to their own scriptures, the scriptures that they thought that they understood so well, and gave them the key to the true understanding of them. I think I was worth reading. Did your heart warm? As you see, Christ in all the Bible, because that's the means of the experience. Now, there's been such a thing as the Toronto Blessing. Have you heard of that? In certain meetings, people fall down, they meow like cats, they snort like pigs, and they bark like dogs. Isn't that a million miles from what we're, what we're talking about here? People have all sorts of experiences in religious meetings where there is no content and no exaltation of Christ. And that is fake, counterfeit nonsense. But there is true spiritual experience brought about by Jesus Christ and mediated to us by the scriptures. Number five the nature of that experience. Verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? There are such things as emotions. Our forefathers called them affections. They were stirred as Jesus did his Bible study. They were moved, greatly moved. They felt as if it was, there was a fire lighting in them which was going to burst out as the scriptures were opened and as the Old Testament was explained. It was a burning. People talk about God's chosen frozen or God's frozen chosen, I'm not sure which. We're not talking about that. There was nothing dead about their response, nothing sleepy, nothing lukewarm, and nothing indifferent. Two things were happening. Can you see what they are? They could see it. And because they could see it, they felt it. In other words, there was light. Just like a fire, that's why they use the word burning. But in, in a fire, there's not just light. There's warmth. There was a glory in it. There's what our forefathers called, and what one of the brothers in the room up there prayed just now, a ravished heart. And they wanted to hold on to him because of everything he was telling them. Now it's possible to play on emotions. Emotions can be manipulated. Certain music can manipulate people. 
and it's a very advanced science now and people play with computers and work out what moves people and what sells records and then they actually get the computers to compose the message, compose the music and put their name on it and become multi-millionaires and can you believe it, celebrities. <laughs> Isn't it pathetic? But you can manipulate emotions. Have you ever sat in a traffic jam and... <coughs> <coughs> have you I don't mean someone banging on the horn I just mean because they, they get drunk on this stuff and they, it does something to their feelings but it has no content it's just a noise to a, a beat which has been proved to be psychologically effective Volume can create emotion. You're more likely to get some form of reaction from someone if you shout at them. But, and stories of certain sorts. You know, some of the stories which have been written in the past, they were real emotional manipulation. And people say, oh, I must buy the next one. God, I had a really good weep when I read that one. We don't play on emotion and we don't appeal to emotion, but where there is no emotion, we do say, Jesus Christ has not been met with. It would be impossible to meet the living Son of God and be indifferent. Number six, we come to the result of that experience. There's two disciples having an experience, an identical experience. The author of the experience is the risen Christ. The means of the experience is the scripture. And the nature of the experience is a burning heart by which they have light and heat. The result of the experience is in verse 33. True spiritual experience has an effect upon people. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. You say you've had some experience of Christ? Okay. What followed it? What happened next? They had a burning heart. They saw. They felt. They wanted to hold on to him. They wanted Christ. But he vanished out of their sight. So what do they do next? Say, so isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? I know a man who had a spiritual experience. And I said, well, what was the effect? Oh, he said. You know where he came from. <laughs> I was transfixed, he said. I think I'm quoting him almost exactly. I just sat in my seat and I couldn't move. I just couldn't move. Well, they got up, verse 33, and returned at once to Jerusalem. And what sort of speed do you think they went? They want to get back there into the fellowship, don't they? They want to talk about Jesus. Yes, Jesus has met them. Isn't that great news? This is what happened to us. He met us and we recognized him. There's self forgetfulness that's the point and that surely is the fruit of genuine spiritual experience wherever it's found people are engrossed with Jesus Christ engrossed by the fact that other people may benefit from what they've got to tell them and they talk about him and his relationship to themselves every time someone's filled with the spirit in the New Testament and there are no exceptions they talk about Jesus Christ. Some people believe that the sign of filling of the Spirit, 
filling of the Spirit as they speak in other languages. The sign of filling in the Spirit is that you speak about Jesus Christ because that's what you want to do and can hardly help yourself doing. Christ is all. Christ is all. So what do we have in this passage? In short, we have an account of this great experience. And we have this great lesson to learn. A true meeting with Christ is felt. I'm very worried about this myself. There is what we call deductive conversion. I'm a sinner. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. I'm a sinner. I've prayed the prayer and therefore I'm all right. But it's just a deduction. That's all. There's that truth and that truth and I've done that and therefore this must be true. I think I've told you this before but it'll bear repetition. I went down to London once to the Westminster Fellowship which is an assembly of ministers of which I've been a member for 30 or more years and I was late because the train was late. <laughs> I arrived in this meeting and when folks saw me come in because you had to come into the meeting where everyone faced you. Always a bit embarrassing that, isn't it? But that was the only door in. Everybody saw me come in and someone said, found me a place because the place was crowded and said, it's wonderful, glad to hear it. <laughs> Fellow behind leans forward goes, marvellous news. Will you call it revival? Well, I don't know what was going on. <laughs> And several people came up to me quite quickly afterwards and said similar things to me. We've heard about it, they said. We've heard about the revival in Breck Road, Liverpool. Have you ever been to Breck Road, Liverpool? What had happened was that two people from another country, which will be nameless, but it's the other side of the Atlantic, and presently <coughs> President Obama <is> the <laughs> is directing it, they had come to Liverpool, and they'd gone to the bus stops, and they'd said, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe he died for you? Do you believe you pray, if you pray to him he'll forgive you? Would you say this prayer? And you know a scouser, don't you? Let's get rid of this fella. <laughs> so they just comply. So all these people praying at the bus stop just get rid of this crank. <laughs> and they went all the way down Breck Road. They recorded 200 people who prayed the prayer. Then they, they told people, revival had broken out on the Breck Road. That's not spiritual experience, is it? What is it? It's sheer deceit. But there is such a thing as spiritual experience. Do you know the devil was in church this morning and the devil's in church tonight? And he, he's infuriated. There's one thing that the devil cannot stand. He cannot stand the name of Jesus Christ. He cannot stand the worship of Jesus Christ. And he cannot, he cannot stand the thought that Jesus Christ is, is Lord. Our first hymn would have sent the devil livid. Our first words were, Jesus is Lord. It's the very thing he doesn't want to hear. He can come to church, but he can't stay motionless. Passion comes out of him. So how come that some people can come to a church and sing, listen to it. Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through creation, resplendent power, eternal word, our rock the Son of God, the King, whose glory fills the heavens, yet bids us come to taste this living bread? How come people can read that and be completely unmoved? That's what we call hard-heartedness. It's stone hearts that behave like that. But the Christian life starts with feltness 
continues with feltness. You cannot repent without feeling something. Impossible. How could you be sorry for your sins without being sorry for your sins? And how could you feel the guilt of your sin without being cut right down into your soul? And how could you flee to Jesus Christ without some sense of relief? Impossible. And in the Christian life, there is a feltness about it, a true feltness. What troubles me is there's little expectancy in this realm. Do you expect to feel when you sing? And do you expect to feel when you pray? And do you expect to feel when you listen? And do you expect to feel when you study the Bible on your own? Do you expect that? If you've never felt any sense of wonder, relief, sorry, sorrow for sin, and some, some burningness about the glory of Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus Christ and his cross is taught in the scripture, you're in deep spiritual trouble and you need to pray to the Lord right now in the secret of your heart and say, Lord, I have never felt anything. I've never had a true meeting with you and I ask you to step into my situation and to save me now and deliver me from this terrible situation in which I'm in. Give me some reality, Lord, in what I believe, because up to now it's just words. But it's not entered right inside me. And we as Christians, we need to pray that there'll be more feltness in our Christianity. It's a terrible thing to listen to a preacher who as he preaches feels nothing and doesn't expect you to feel anything, who just gives you information. There's the information. It's this computer transferring it to that memory stick. That's all it is. That's not preaching. It's spiritual damage. And what a terrible thing for people to come listening to the listening to scripture all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be mature in every way equipped for every good work and to listen to scripture without any sense of Passion, disappointment, joy, or tears is an unspeakably awful situation to be in. And to sing great truths and be unmoved is to fall under the condemnation of Scripture, which says, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. If there was a feltness that returned, what would that do to me when I speak to others about Christ on those few opportunities that I get? What different note would there be in the way that I speak? And therefore God has left us this wonderful historical incident to remind us True religion is felt religion.